Hello everybody, welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing well and that you're all having a fantastic day. And without further ado, let's jump right into it. The leading stock exchange known as NASDAQ has paused its intentions to launch a cryptocurrency custody service due to what they say are the shifting business and regulatory environment within the United States. Um, years ago, one of the there were multiple layers of what people thought would cause Bitcoin to go mainstream. The original idea, as crazy as it now sounds, was video games. The idea was that um, a younger audience playing video games at some point would find out what cryptocurrencies were. Uh, they would latch on to it. And therefore, this is, I mean, this is like a good four years ago at this point. A lot of people believed that making blockchain games would kind of be the, the main caveat that would uh, shift focus into the cryptocurrency space, uh, what have you. There were a lot of cryptocurrency games that were on blockchains that have like 18 transactions, 30 transactions per second, and they were as clunky as you might believe. By the time 2017 ended and we moved swiftly into 2018 where everyone was all the world leaders were discussing and screaming that they were going to be banning cryptocurrencies. Um, a lot of institutions actually came out in favor of crypto. And this is where we get that time frame of 2014 to 2017. I've mentioned before in other videos where a lot of institutions, a lot of billionaires um, and millionaires as well. Uh, began to announce that they were uh, getting into crypto or had already been into crypto. Many of them, dating back to 2013, 2014, uh, stated that crypto was terrible. It shouldn't be used by anyone. The only one who's really uh, stuck to it has been Warren Buffett, at least at this point. Everyone else has backtracked, backtracked or flip-flopped in some sort of way. And now they are like desperately into crypto. Uh, towards the middle of 2018, we began to hear that a uh, apparently a large number of financial institutions were getting into the cryptocurrency space. This was m more or less around the time when I personally uh, stopped liking Coinbase as much. Coinbase and Gemini, I didn't care for them, and people. And I don't know if I'm, I must have told you why if you've been here before. Uh, we moved the cryptocurrency markets, us, the, the retail investors, the, the, the normal everyday people who may buy $50, $150, $300 per month of crypto. Uh, we were the main movers of the market. By the end or middle of 2018, moving into 2019, uh, the idea was that rich people would save us. Rich people were going to swoop in and tell us that uh, they would control the market, they would take care of everything. 2018-2019 uh, is when Gemini and Coinbase, for those of you who don't know, uh, began to announce that they were launching a bunch of new products onto their platform and that they would only be for the wealthy. They, they use the term uh, institutional, but it basically means people who have like a large amount of of liquid wealth, not just you own a whole bunch of something, but that you have money that can constantly slosh in and out of, of the market. Uh, part of the issue is, is that um, these people never came, or rather they were simply more silent and not as prevalent as we were told that they were going to be. It was the idea that by the year 2019, end of 2019, beginning of 2020, cryptocurrencies would be on a whole nother level because we would have had a physical Bitcoin ETF, which never happened. We would have had a mainstream custody solutions. That is to say the larger institutions would have rushed desperately into crypto to be able to uh, hold, buy and sell it for everyday normal people. This is why I mentioned a couple of years ago. When we hear now that banks are actively getting uh, licenses, and are trying to make sure that they can hold, buy, sell, custody cryptocurrencies for their customers. I didn't expect this for another 10 to 15 years because of how adamantly everyone was announcing out loud that they were not going to get into the cryptocurrency space because it was only for criminals or people who didn't understand finance. So whenever we hear 
that billionaires are like, oh, no, I've been here for a long time. This is why I always go. Of, of, of course you were. You told everyone years ago not to get into it so that they would be afraid prices would fall and that they could buy up all the coins. And this is where the these mega whales come from. Uh, the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange were actually two of the entities who announced many years ago that they were going to get into the cryptocurrency space, which for me, as you know, one would assume logically, if you're in a space, if you're in a market that no one allegedly wants to touch, no one wants to be near it, it's terrible, it's awful, it smells, and then you have the two largest stock exchanges on the planet announcing that they're getting into it, it causes a lot of fuss and a lot of hubbub. Um, for those of you not looking at the screen, this is an old article. Uh, it says 22nd of January 2019. This was around the time where the CEO of the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange uh, both announced that they believed that Bitcoin uh, would be a world currency. And I hold back when it comes to saying the only currency. But that was kind of the general sentiment that we were given from these institutions. And this is where a lot of the, once again, the crypto exchanges kind of uh, changed their mindset. The people who built up their platforms and who were giving them money after all these years were no longer a priority when it came to um, building up the cryptocurrency sector, as it were. So NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange both announced that they would be creating something. For those of you who don't remember what the other one was, it was called BACKT, B-A-K-K-T. It was basically a bunch of people who tried to be hip and young. Uh, instead of spelling it B-A-C-K-E-D, like this exchange is backed by Bitcoin, they wrote B-A-K-K-T trying to play off of the the words from HODL, which is a misspelling of the word hold. And they launched back in an effort to try and get more institutions into the space. But this ended up being very similar to what um, JP Morgan did. A number of years ago, JP Morgan launched JP Morgan Coin, assuming that institutions and people would fall over themselves for this coin, as they were actually calling it. A number of years ago, one of the main ideas from people within government and the banking sector is that we, me, you, I, us, were far too dumb to understand finance, that this isn't a joke, that we were too dumb to understand finance in any capacity, and that we simply wanted a new form of money, something digital. And therefore, this is where we got the idea of central bank digital currencies and JP Morgan coin. If you remember at the beginning of uh, Benny, beginning or middle of 2020, I don't remember the time frame anymore, of when the entire Wall Street bets thing was happening. And we were talking about it on this channel. And one of the main things that kept on popping up is that uh, normal everyday people were making money uh, from the Wall Street bets uh, subreddit. And they were making money off of Dogecoin and off of... Um, uh, GameStop and also Bed Bath and Beyond and you name it, a, a large number of uh, very vocal millionaires and billionaires began to go on CNBC and Fox Business, uh, saying that everyone who was doing this was essentially a loser. I I, I left the I mean this is old. I left you a link years ago of one of the news stories where this guy I think it was on CNBC and he sat there very smug and he was saying. Uh, he thought the idea of normal people being in the market was nonsense. You you find this out later that, of course, uh, he had money in one of the hedge funds that was losing all of their money. So his idea was simply, if I can uh, make all these people feel bad, they'll leave the market because making money isn't for normal people. He was the guy who said um, he thinks that people should go outside and you know go on walks and look for girlfriends as opposed to actually trying to make money online. You know, why Why would you want to be home making money when you can go and live your life? That kind of, of thing. The, like, the, the, these people are rotten to the actual core. And it, it drives me completely insane. And this is why I make videos and I make sure to tell you when one of these people says something so that you understand what they said years ago and what they're saying now. They don't believe that we should be in this market. This market was made by us. It was held up by us, and these people are 
Uh, I don't want to say part of the problem, but they're a huge portion of the people who are siphoning off the coins that are actually left on the market. That's also uh, in the news here as well as we continuously uh, move forward. Anyway, uh, bringing it back to where we were before, uh, the Nasdaq announced that they were apparently trying to launch a crypto exchange. I think this was a couple of years ago and it didn't go through or whatever the case might have been. And then they also said the same exact thing for their custody solution, which is what we're talking about right now. What I think has actually happened, and this is my uh, viewpoint, my vantage point from having been in the market for so long, I think nobody wants to deal with the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. The reason for back to launching uh, was that they thought it would be the place that institutions would want to go to acquire their Bitcoin. The idea was, well, no one wants to use Binance. It's 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 too new. You know, it's it's run by this guy from China. Nobody wants to use Coinbase. How, why why would they want to use the you know this platform? Let's do something that that the the bigger players will actually want to do. What they didn't realize is that the the larger players were actually already using Binance and also using Coinbase. I'm not too sure about uh, Gemini, but this also plays true. When you look at the people who have the, the, the seven companies and the 12 filings for a physical Bitcoin ETF that are currently uh, in the running, they're all trying to use Coinbase as their uh, custody solution and also their, like, their holding company. So clearly people have been using Coinbase for... A very long time. Uh, when you when you look at companies who are actually trying to launch initiatives like this, a couple of things happen. It's not simply that these people from Nasdaq one day wake up and they want decentralization and they want to help the world. Uh, you you gauge interest. You send out newsletters. You talk to the largest investors and you go, "Would you be interested in this product?" Because it costs billions of dollars to build these things. It's not like a you know, you hire someone from Fiverr, they make you a website and you go, okay, cool, this is it. This is what we got. It takes a lot of planning and a lot of things. And I realistically think that the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, I think they got no interest. We had news, uh, I think maybe the beginning of this summer, maybe sometime in spring, uh, where apparently backed, they have like, I think a Bitcoin futures trading platform. And apparently they had... Um, I think one one day they had zero percent zero dollars trading volume. Think of that zero. No one used it. No one wanted to use it. And I think this is kind of where it is. But it's 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 an easier scapegoat as the Nasdaq to say, oh no, we you know we don't want to do it because of the regulatory environment. You're you're the Nasdaq. Like you can get anything pushed through that you want to get pushed through. Like you are the holder of securities. You are the stock market. Within the United States of America, I don't believe for a second being run run by hundred millionaires and and billionaires who probably sit on the board uh, that one of them didn't know anyone in the SEC and therefore couldn't get this actually uh, pushed through. Uh, several individuals, such as Coinbase's CEO Brian Armstrong and Circle's boss Jeremy Allaire have criticized the American watchdogs, the SEC, for their approach towards the digital asset industry claiming it could push investors and capital abroad, which it has already done. This is also another really weird, uh, the word's not reflection, uh, kind of. I'll use the word reflection. Um, the generalized idea years ago, and this is what I tried to let people understand, but I think people don't want to hear a lot of what I have to say because I, I think it's far too logical for people. If you don't allow people to do what they want to do within your borders, they will simply leave. It's not a question of, oh, people will sit still while we make sure that they don't have what they want in the cryptocurrency space. No, of course, people got up and they moved. That's why one of the first places to have a physical Bitcoin ETF was Canada, because Canada was like, okay, cool. Let's make cryptocurrency regulations. Let's give a physical Bitcoin and Ethereum ETF. And remember, we had news that a couple of banks announced that they were simply going up to Canada to, to, to deal with what they had to do or whatever they were trying to do with the actual Bitcoin ETF. Um, I think a lot of the regulators within the United States uh, live under the impression that uh, they can take as long as they want to do something and everyone else simply has to adhere to it. This is why every other time that we get news 
uh, that Japan, that Hong Kong, that Singapore, that Dubai, that London, that Paris, that Germany has great cryptocurrency biz, that, that, you know, all these different countries, they're siphoning away money that could have stayed or would have stayed within the United States. But that's an entirely different discussion altogether. So yeah, the people from the NASDAQ have said, or at least stated right now, uh, we've heard this before, and it usually is not completely true. They've stated before that they're, you know, it's on it's on hold, regulatory environment. They're probably they probably have asked a number of people, uh, would you do this? And people simply came back with like, no, we have no interest in using you because we're using other platforms. It's not like this is in 1992. The Nasdaq and and the New York Stock Exchange aren't the only uh, platforms out there that people can use to to trade money or to do other things with, especially not within the cryptocurrency space. Uh, Anyway, I found this very interesting that they uh, thought of putting out something like this as if we're supposed to be like, oh my gosh, even the NASDAQ? No, that's, that's complete nonsense. They can get anything pushed through that they want. They probably have no interest and they probably don't want another situation like the New York Stock Exchange and backed where no one's using them. Part of, part of the lie that we've been told over the course of the last couple of years is that, is that Binance and Coinbase are terrible and no one should be using them. They're only for, you know, uh, lower than, et cetera, et cetera. But that's where all the money is, is flowing to. And you can't, as the NASDAQ, say that you launched something for crypto. Like, think of a market that's going to be worth trillions of dollars and then you have no one using it because they would rather use... Binance and Coinbase. So I assume when the market does pick back up, pick back up, I mean like completely go insane, uh, the NASDAQ will then announce, oh, we we got the paperwork. Isn't that amazing? That that kind of thing. But I still think people won't use them because you waited too long. You had the chance to do this back in 2017, 2018. You waited all these years for what? Everyone else has an established platform that they're already using that they have been using for years. Anyway, that's the NASDAQ apparently can't launch their crypto uh, services because of regulatory uh, compliance. Um, I'm sure that's what it is. Okay, let's move on. Also in the news, it says XRP wallets holding at least 1 million XRP have surged to over 1,900 wallets amid the growing interest in XRP following the lawsuit victory. The amount of uh, whale news is is creeping its head back into the crypto news. It was away for a couple of weeks. We we hear a lot, uh, uh, often, uh, from whale report type of places that people are buying or like a huge movement of coins have moved. Uh, We're starting to get once again exactly which wallets they're moving into and how much accumulation is actually happening. It's once again one thing to hear that a company uh, maybe bought $10 million of a coin, but to see the actual wallet addresses that have been accumulating for a while is something completely different. It says, following the recent legal victory, XRP has seen a significant increase in demand promoting investors or prompting investors to bolster their holdings. As a result, the number of XRP wallets holding at least 1 million coins went over 1,900. According to real-time on-chain data provided by the XRP ledger analytics firm, a a platform known as Richlist, that that seems completely logical. Here's a little chart right here. It's a lot, maybe a little bit easier to see. Uh, apparently there are a lot of wallets that hold, I'm actually kind of shocked at this, that hold over a million XRP. It's probably, uh, maybe just roughly around like 2000 or something like that or near it. Uh, and a lot of other people, of course, the number gets a lot larger, the lower the amount actually ends up going. Um, we've known about heavy XRP accumulation for a while, while the... A uh, lawsuit was in its, you know, uh, beginning stages. We had a lot of news that people around the world were buying a lot of XRP. We had a lot of news, which was also meant to scare you and the rest of the market, uh, that whenever uh, Ripple um, had the the escrow unlocked, that they were selling a huge amount of coins. And I had to tell all of you, not that you didn't know, but it's more of a 
putting the news out there. A lot of people were trying to spread rumors and lies once again because people have nothing better to do with their time. That Ripple was selling these coins on the open market. Uh, the idea being you unlock a billion coins and then you dump them onto the market so that they could make money. You, you, you have to understand that Ripple stands to make an egregious amount of money uh, from XRP succeeding. Why would they be trying to make a couple of million dollars every month and then disappearing? They want this to last forever. I can't stress any of that enough. What they were actually doing every time that the escrow was unlocking and they were selling XRP, they were selling it to institutions and banks. How do we know this? Because they released a press release usually right after saying, hey, we just partnered with this bank. Hey, we just partnered with this remittance company and they're using XRP to send money from uh, Mexico to the Philippines. We saw it multiple different times, but uh, now we're getting like actual like physical numbers as to like how many wallets are actually holding this many coins. And um, I think it's fascinating what happens and what is going to happen as we move further into the next uh, bull run. Uh, a lot of people, and I, and I understand it's, it's part of the psychology of fear in that you don't have, uh, what's the word? There isn't a guarantee that prices are going to move back up. Uh, but when prices do move back up, there's always this like uh, fevered rush by a lot of people who didn't buy over the course of a two-year period. They sit there wondering why the market isn't moving. They don't pay attention to the news. They don't buy anything. Prices end up moving back up. And, I, and I've seen it happen before, and it's, it's, it's a really weird thing where we will get news uh, that a lot of people, you've seen it before, a lot, you know, the, the, the amount of people holding XRP and Bitcoin and Ethereum, these brand new millionaires that have been minted. There are now five new Bitcoin billionaires on the planet, you know, so and so and so. Is because they were buying when prices were low. That's not financial device. It's 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 more of a just a logic thing. A lot of people I've known people who have told me how annoyed they were that they uh, hadn't made a lot of money during a bull run while other people did. And I'm like, well, that's that's because you didn't you didn't buy anything. You made sure not to buy when prices were low because you were like, maybe the market's done for. So that's another really weird thing to uh, think about. Yeah, the amount of people buying up these coins continues. I told you institutions have been here for a while, but I think people need to see the numbers. And I know that I'm maybe at that point potentially just breaking through to one or two other people because I don't understand. I mean, I tried to put myself in a position of others in that why would I not react when something's going on? But I'm also a person that you, none of you probably know this. I, I hate procrastination. It drives me crazy and it gives me a massive amount of anxiety. If something has to be done, I do it at that moment because the idea of waiting for something or knowing that I could do something in that moment, but I wait, it gives me like insane an anxiety. So I try to, you know, put myself in the shoes of others and be like, why would I wait? Why would I? And I, and I haven't figured out an answer at least not at the um, at the moment. Uh, tying directly into uh, this news as well. This website's very weird. They keep cutting off like the top half of the information, and I'm not really sure why something's wrong with their platform. Uh, Long-term Bitcoin holders or addresses that hold coins for at least half a year now control a record three fourths. Of the cryptocurrency circulating supply, I'll say that one more time. The um, there's a different way to gauge when a bull run is going to happen. It's not so much that prices are rumbling and things are going up. It's when a a coin is becoming relatively illiquid, and it's not that uh, Bitcoin's market is slowing down. It's not that there's uh, not hundreds of millions of billions of dollars flowing through Bitcoin. It's the amount of Bitcoin that is accumulated against the amount of time that it's being held. If you buy a Bitcoin and you trade it the next day, you are clearly a cryptocurrency trader. If you buy a coin and you hold it for 10 days, it appears that you're trying to find a better price to be able to sell it. One of the larger metrics is if you are holding your coins for half of a year to a year 
three years, four years. It appears as if you are um, accumulating with no intent of selling anytime soon and or selling when you believe that the market is peaking or has peaked. It's another one of the, the metrics. We get constant news all the time. And I uh, am happy for the people who are actually here. I noticed that a lot of um, other cryptocurrency YouTube channels, I click through them sometimes because I want to see not what's going on, but try to understand the mindset of some of these other channels who sometimes get nine times, 10 times, 15 times the amount of views that I get. And it's mainly like these uh, let's do a technical analysis and they can't really tell you anything because the chart is going to move on its own based off of whales and their actual interactions with the market. There's never any actual news of what's taking place or as to why X is happening. It's more of a let me give you uh, the hype that's currently going on. We here and I when I say that I'm happy that you're all here is because I try my best as I can to give you what real news there actually is out there. I want you to understand when I say that all the Bitcoin is almost gone, you understand that all the Bitcoin is almost gone. When I tell you that whales are buying huge amounts of XRP, you understand that the richest people on the planet are aiming for a 10, 15, $25 XRP, and this is why they're accumulating so much. When I tell you that Ethereum is going to transition to proof of stake, and going to have staking, and people are not going to dump their coins onto the market because they're anticipating that this is going to be the new way to make passive income. That's why I tell you these things. When you talk about that, the entirety of Bitcoin's circulating supply is not a lot. Yes, there will eventually be 21 million coins, but it is widely believed by a large number of analysts that there are anywhere between five to six million Bitcoin that are lost and gone forever. We've gone over this before. The idea is people, years ago when the block reward was a lot higher and Bitcoin was worth a couple of cents, people never believed that it could be as big as it is now. So they threw away their old computers. They lost them. Computer, you know, you, you name it. Something happened. And it appears that millions of Bitcoin are no longer in service. They will never be recovered in some sort of way. When you get news that these mega institutions are getting into the space, when you hear that BlackRock and Fidelity are here, you think that they're standing on the sidelines, twiddling their thumbs, going, okay, let's wait. Let's wait till Bitcoin goes back up to 70,000 to buy anything. That's not how this works. Bitcoin is estimated to hit a million plus dollars in the future. And this number sounds abstract to a lot of people, who A, haven't done their own research, or B, don't want to understand. There's a very weird disconnect between people in crypto and actual reality, and that is to say, a lot of people fall under the mantra or the idea that their coin alone is going to make it. I found this crappy coin from a couple of years ago. It did me pretty well. I'm waiting for the next bull run. This coin is going to be around forever. You you hear something, the, the, the idea of Bitcoin going from one cent to $69,000 makes a lot of sense to you. Why? Because you've seen it take place. Based off of the metrics that we keep getting about the level of accumulation, who's accumulating, who's not selling their coins, and these coins are now stashed away for a very long time, and they will be probably forever. There are a large number of Bitcoin maximalists even who have no intention of even selling their coins or getting rid of their coins until Bitcoin is in the high six figures. And then they don't plan on selling. They plan on using their Bitcoin in everyday life. When you add all of these things together and you talk about that three-fourths, 75% of all Bitcoin has been removed from the circulating supply and is not moving. This is where you get these numbers from. This is where the, the disconnect, I believe, happens, like literally at that moment where people don't understand what these numbers mean. It's kind of like, you know, the, the idea of humans trying to understand how many stars are in the sky or how large, even just how large our galaxy is, is nearly incomprehensible because we only work in metrics of my house, my town, my city, this country. 
the idea of the planet that we're on and the other planets that are constantly circulating around us and everything else that may be expansive after that is hard for us to grasp. It's, it's, it's the same exact way with humans and the number um, infinity. You, We only know a beginning and an end. To think of something that has no end boggles the complete mind. The idea of some, we, we only, how do I say this? We live in a world of relative abundance. If we figured out more how to recycle things, we would live in a world of infinite abundance because it would be the, this loop that constantly continues. We live in a world of economic policies where infinity is actually the number, where you can print as much as you want, you can create as much as you want. You know a world where you can walk into a store and buy a new phone every single year because there will always be a new phone for you to buy. There will always be a new car. There will always be a new house. There will always be a new something that you can get your hands on. If someone told you that there were only 21 million phones in the world, you would understand a bit more because you understand how important your phone is to you. You hold it in your hand every single day. It means a lot to you. When someone says that there are only 21 million of a number on a screen, it's difficult for us to understand it because even if you look right here, this is a number on the screen. It means nearly nothing to us. We know that if someone decides to edit it, this number can change. Bitcoin's number cannot and will not change. We are living in a very interesting time now. And I think the only thing that's going to alleviate a large portion of this is the future. That sounds weird, I know. People, the amount of people who are into crypto, and I mean really into it, I'm not talking about the people who are here for Pepe or, or here to see uh, what these other nonsense coins are going to do. The people who are really, I mean, who stick with this channel, who are here all the time, hello to all of you out there, who understand what Bitcoin is, who understand what Ethereum is, and then the other fraction of them who don't even hold some of the largest coins, we're going to get to a point in life where Bitcoin hits half a million dollars per coin and the light is going to turn on above a lot of people's heads, almost like a cartoon, where they will understand that they had the opportunity to purchase this when the price was a lot lower. And this goes for every single coin. For a lot of you, this may be your first market cycle, but for a lot of you, it also will not be your last. You will be here for other market cycles and you will understand what it means when you see that prices simply aren't moving. It, it's it's not a, a thing for you to be like, well, that's it, you know, cool, prices aren't moving, I'm out of the market. You Like I've noticed like it, it, it's so apparent and so immediate when prices are dropping or when the market is stagnant. My views also like literally will match mathematically what's happened with the market. The moment the market goes back up, even if it's just for th five days, I see my views change as well. It's people who hop onto the bandwagon when it's convenient for them. Uh, these are the people who years down the line or even during a bull run say, I, why didn't I make as much money as everyone else? I was in the market when they actually weren't in the market. A large number of people who for some reason keep counting out the largest coin that we have that's been around for more than a decade that will be around potentially for another 100 at least 120 years as this coin is being mined, I think are in for a gigantic shock. And I think, once again, the only thing that alleviates that is the actual future. It's people seeing what they've missed out on, and that causes them to uh, rush into the market and, you know, desperately try and stay. But it's happened to all of us. Like, I, I remember, I remember hearing about Bitcoin around 2011 and I was like, what did this makes no sense? Why would anyone want this? I remember seeing the price on TV and people were talking about it. It was like an all new high. It kept on going up. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. I get into the market years and years later and it begins to make sense because I'm like, oh, I should have bought when the price was a lot lower. It's this kind of thing, but it's just seeming, seemingly a, a, a cycle for, for everyone out there when it comes to getting into the market. Um, data tracked by blockchain analytics firm Glassnode shows that the balance held in wallets uh, that have been holding for at least more than half a year, around half a year, uh, increased by 62,000 Bitcoin. 62,000 Bitcoin, $1.8 billion, to a record of 14.5 million Bitcoin just this month. 
surpassing the previous peak of 14.48 million Bitcoin registered on the 21st of March. The new high means now um, holders of over 75% of Bitcoin are, are, are being held just by these wallets alone. I don't get how you can have fact in front of you and it means potentially almost nothing. Uh, I, I can't hear news like this and read news like this and me myself be inactive in, in the market. I still try in... Is the word in earnest? I don't think that's in, in even it. F futile, futilely. Futilization, I don't, I don't know what word is it's supposed to go there. Uh, I try to get my friends to see what's going on in the market. There we go. But the you know, but my 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 works are futile. They simply don't want to know. A lot of people exist on another plane of not existence, but they're going through so many other things in their life. The last thing they want to hear from me is being like, you should buy this digital coin, but I find it a shame, a real shame, that so many people who are in the market, who are looking at this news, completely discard it and, and, and don't uh, look towards the future, like look towards what these institutions are doing. But, and I say this in the most unmean way possible, the reason why a lot of people have generational wealth is because they look deep forward. It's not, I, I'm, I'm doing this for the next month. It's what I'm building is going to last me for 15 to 20 years. And in 15 to 20 years, the amount that I will have will be able to last for the next generations. And this is what I think we're seeing right now. I Last thought, it, it's always the thing that gets me is the uh, $100 million Bitcoin um, price prediction. That, that forever always sticks in my head. If we end up living in the, so for, for those of you who don't know, the idea of a $100 million Bitcoin means that Bitcoin has increasingly constantly absorbed uh, the amount of value from nearly everything else on the planet. People have decided that other things are relatively worthless because Bitcoin keeps going up and they can't stop themselves from putting money into the market anymore. But this also then means that what would be the equivalent of one US dollar is then equivalent to one Satoshi. And I've sat there so many times uh, telling my friends, I'm like, have you thought about at least putting like a, a million, you know, like a, like getting a million Satoshis? Um, and they look at me like I'm completely insane because I'm like, I personally find it that it would be really cool if I told my friend to get this thing that ended up being worth that much. And basically, they put three hundred dollars into the market to make a million dollars over the next couple of you know uh, potentially decades. But yeah, so the news is uh, the amount of Bitcoin being accumulated continues to increase. Uh, it is going into what you may call diamond hands. They're they're holding for a very long time, and I think uh, for those of you who haven't seen, the idea is that by twenty thirty two, that having we will have a one to five million dollar Bitcoin. And at that point, Bitcoin can basically be paid. You, 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 can, you can pay for anything exclusively with Bitcoin. But when you talk about these people who are accumulating massive amounts of it, they are going to be and will continue to probably forever be the wealthiest people that we have on the planet. Very, very interesting times ahead. The world is changing. It has changed. And I think it's only going to get crazier from here. Um, yeah. I do sincerely hope that you have all enjoyed. I do hope that you all are having a great day, a great morning, a great afternoon, a great evening. Wherever you are, wherever you might be, I do hope it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching, listening, liking, commenting, and or uh, supporting. And I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.